toilet paper ballots, and campaign finance reform. Congress can only be accountable to us when corporations stop funding them. Advocate for renewable and new energy technology. Bring the conversation about free energy out into the open. It will transform the power dynamic on this planet faster than anything in recorded history. Sign up for critical mass actions. It's a strategy to leverage our power by waiting until a huge number of us agree to participate before taking an action. Imagine a million of us acting in unison. Then again, imagine even more. I've been inspired by how many grounded solutions and real-life problem solvers there actually are. Akila Sharils is one person whose work especially touched me. He helped broker a gang truce between the Crips and Bloods. One of the things that we discovered in the process of, uh, of waging peace in the neighborhood was that conflict is healthy. You know, it's actual, it's unresolved conflict that actually leads to violence. When we first launched the peace treaty, we've had, we had a lot of success in our first year. Gang homicides dropped 44% in the neighborhood based upon our actions. Akila describes what happened when two rival gang leaders finally met after the truce. The brother came up to him and told him, man, look, I know you got some hard feelings for me. You know, maybe I got some hard feelings for you. He said, but because of this truce, man, he said, I'm willing to put all of that to the side. And, um, and he stuck out his hand. He hugged him and he said he closed his eyes because he was preparing for, a, you know, a sharp, you know, a knife to enter his back. He was waiting for the, you know, for a bullet, you know, to be shot into his stomach. But he said after a few moments, you know, he held that, 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 that embrace. You know, he, he realized that, um, you know, that it was genuine. I believe that having a clear picture of our potential is as important as uncovering what stands in its way. So I want to take you to a possible world of the future. It's a world the elite would have you believe is an impossible pipe dream. But I'm convinced it's a world that is utterly within our grasp. We can create a world where people can thrive. Where we can feel safe and secure. The air, water and food are clean. A world where communities are capable of producing their own energy and food. And trade is open and fair. Rather than focusing on punishment, instead justice restores lives and losses. Insurance pays doctors to keep people healthy. Education is voluntary, serving the needs of individuals instead of corporations. We get honest feedback from independent media. There are no subsidies and no bailouts. Imagine that with an honest money system, little or no taxes, and low electric and fuel bills, you would have the money to pay off your home and car and be free to save and invest. You would enjoy more wealth, freedom, and security, all while working the same or probably less. Let's say I started a mutual fund for my neighborhood and all the neighbors had stock, okay? And, and so they healed the environment and their stock went up in value. So instead of getting drained financially, they're making money. They're making money from things that make their kids safer and, and prevent the planet from dying. So you kind of have your cake and eat it too. Instead of working all week to make money and then coming home and trying to save the planet on the weekends, you can spend Monday through Friday making money saving the planet and then, you know, go to the beach. <laughs> This vision of a thriving world is based on what could be called the liberty perspective. There is a simple principle that underlies this approach, non-violation. Nobody gets to violate you or your property, and you don't get to violate anyone else, except in genuine self-defense. This is the one rule I've found that every single person agrees with, at least for themselves. I believe that non-violation is the true north of humanity's moral compass and our core navigating insight. This insight can guide us and protect each and every individual as we set up voluntary self-sustaining systems. It is a way of living that I can stand for wholeheartedly and without reservation. 
I've been profoundly influenced by the work of Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, who developed a whole philosophy and economic system based on the core ethic of non-aggression. Motivated by having witnessed the ravages of communism and fascism in Europe, he committed his life to finding a just way. He recognized that those systems, as well as socialism and even democracy, wrongly assume the rights of the collective, or the group, to be more important than those of the individual. I had always gone along with the view that more people will thrive if we consider the group's needs above the individual's. But when I took a closer look, I found it doesn't really work that way. In the name of what's best for the group, governments have been responsible for most of the war, death, and destruction on the planet. More than 200 million individuals were killed in the 20th century alone. So how would applying the principle of non-violation change this dynamic? It would take us from incremental change of a fundamentally flawed system to a complete transformation where not just some or even the majority, but everyone could truly have the opportunity to thrive. In order to implement the principle of non-violation, it makes sense to me to honestly re-examine our past because it doesn't work to try to build a healthy living system on top of an unhealthy one. We have to go back to the most fundamental acts of injustice upon which the country was founded in the seizure of the lands of the people and the slaughter of their women and children uh, in, the, in the, uh, the rendering destitute most of the remnants of these people is such a, an grievous wrong uh, that we believe that we have to deal with that to come to grips with that in a fundamental way understanding that they're not wrongs that were done and completed uh, 150 years ago they're wrongs that are continued every single day so you have you know through the history of North America and the United States over 500 treaties signed with indigenous nations where every single one of them now has been violated you have, in fact, a tremendous amount of wealth having been generated from indigenous people's lands and resources and billions of dollars every year still being generated by corporations and European nations based on the continued exploitation of indigenous people's lands and resources. If we didn't have large corporations, if we didn't have Western governments defining how you and I were to relate to each other, living here in North America now together, how would we relate to one another? How would we make it different? It's going to take time and courageous effort to shift the consciousness and accomplish the tasks that will move us toward the world I'm talking about. And yet I know of no greater gift that we could give to future generations. We can't do everything at once. I envision three overlapping stages of the solutions process. In stage one, we bring as much integrity as possible to our current systems. If we cut the U.S. military budget in half, it would still roughly equal the defense spending of the entire rest of the world. Between that and getting rid of the Federal Reserve, over a trillion dollars a year would be freed. Enough to feed everyone on our planet, deal with social issues, and heal our environment. Many people believe that widespread starvation and poverty are inevitable. But compared to war, eliminating poverty and restoring the environment are cheap. According to Lester Brown's Earth Policy Institute, it would take under $200 billion a year to restore the Earth's environment and meet global social goals. But this stage isn't the end goal of the Liberty Perspective. While stage one has a lot of the compassion typically associated with a liberal Democrat agenda, stage two reflects much of the wisdom of the traditional conservative worldview. In stage two, we shrink government's role to protecting individual liberty and stewarding things we share in common, like ecosystems and the airwaves we use to communicate. As the system gains integrity and we move to sound currency, people will have enough money to have more control over everything that affects them. Stage three grows out of the increasing freedom that people gain in stages one and two as they have more money and more time. There is no involuntary tax and therefore no involuntary governance. There's no monopoly on force. There are rules, but no rulers. 
rigorously protecting individual rights turns